Namo Tassa Bagawato Naranto Namo Tassa Namo Tassa one holy one, fully enlightened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. Okay. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Bhante used to have nightmares about this, I'll tell you. We can't even fathom in our mind why anyone would build a sanctuary where there was a heavy population of squirrels. <laughs> so he always points this out when we read this, but they did, okay. Now on that occasion, a number of well-known wanderers were staying at the Peacock's Sanctuary, the Wanderer's Park, that is Anabhara, Bharadhara, and the Wanderer Sakiludayan, as well as other well-known wanderers. And then it was morning, and the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and his outer robe, he went into Rajagaha for alms. And then he thought, it is still too early to wander for alms in Rajagaha. Suppose I went to the wanderer Sakuladayan in the peacock's sanctuary, the wanderer's park. And then the blessed one went to the peacock's sanctuary, the wanderer's park. Now on that occasion, the wanderer Sakuladayan was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar loudly and noisily. They were talking many kinds of pointless talk, such as the talk of kings. Give me a minute. Robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, battles, food, drink, cloth, clothing, beds, garlands, perfumes, relatives, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, countries, about women, heroes, streets, wells, the dead, trifles of the day, the origin of the world, the origin of the sea, whether things are so or not so. And then the wanderer Sakuladayan saw the blessed one coming in the distance and seeing him, he quieted his own assembly thus. Sirs, he said, be quiet. Sirs, make no noise. Here comes the recluse Gotama. This venerable one likes quiet and commends the quiet. Perhaps if he finds our assembly quiet one, he will think and join us. And then the wanderers became silent. The blessed one went to the wanderer, Sakuladayan, who said to him, let the blessed one come, venerable sir. Welcome to the blessed one. It is long since the blessed one found an opportunity to come here. Let the blessed one be seated. This, this seat is ready. The Blessed One sat down on the seat that was made ready, and the wanderer Sakuladayan, he took a low seat and sat down on one side, as was the custom. And when he had done so, the Blessed One asked him, for what discussion are you sitting together here now, Udayan? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? When, venerable sir, let be the discussion for which we are now sitting together here. The blessed one can well hear about it later. And it's not something you usually say to the uh, Buddha when he asks a question, but he's, that's just how he came off and he decided he wanted to talk. In recent days, venerable sir, when recluses and Brahmins of various sects 
have been gathering together and sitting together in the debating hall, the topic has arisen. It is a gain for the people of Anga and Magadha. It is a great gain for the people of Anga and Magadha that these recluses and Brahmins, heads of orders, heads of groups, teachers of groups, well-known, famous founders of sects, regarded by many as saints, they have all come to spend the rains retreat at Rajagaha. There is this Purana Kasapa, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, well-known and famous founder of a sect regarded by many to be as a saint. He has come to spend the rains at Rajagaha. There is also the Mikala Gosala and this uh, Ajita Kesakambalan and this Paduka Pakudha Kachiyana and this Sanjaya Beliaputta, uh, this Niganta Naputta, the head of an order, the head of a group, teacher of a group, well known and famous founder of the sect regarded uh, by many as a saint, and he too has come to spend the rains retreat at Rajagaha. And there is also this recluse Gotama, the head of an order, the head of a group, the teacher of a group, well-known and famous founder of a sect regarded to many, as many as a saint. And he, he too has come to spend the rains retreat at Rajagaha. Now among these worthy recluses and Brahmins, heads of orders and such, regarded many as saints, who is honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples. Who is honored in that way? And how honoring and respecting him do they, do they live in dependence on him? Now, they're asking the question uh, in the subject, basically, which of these teachers are being respected in the same way as Buddha Gautama is respected? And they're finding out that the, the question starts here and let's see what happens. Thereupon, some said this, the Purana Kasapa is a head of an order and such and regarded by many as a saint. And yet he is not honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples, nor do his disciples live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. Uh, once the Purana Kasapa was teaching his Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, and then a certain disciple of his made a noise thus, sirs, do not ask Purana Kasapa this question. He does not know that. We know that. Ask us that question, and we will answer that for you, sirs. And this was the kind of um, dickering that went on between the groups when they were in parks and such. We know this, you don't know it, we know it, and it goes on and on at the time, the arguing that was going on when the Buddha comes. It happened that Purana Kasapa did not get his way, though he waved his arms and wailed out loud. Be quiet, sirs, make no noise, sirs. They are not asking you, sirs, they are asking us and we will answer them. And indeed many of his disciples left him after refuting his doctrine thus. You do not understand this Dhamma and discipline. I understand this Dhamma and discipline. How could you understand the Dhamma and discipline? Your way is wrong, my way is right. I am consistent, you are inconsistent. What should have been said first, you said last. And what should have been said last, you said first. And what you had so carefully thought up has been turned inside out. Your doctrine is refuted. You are proved wrong. Go and learn better. Disentangle yourself if you can. And thus Purana Kasapa is not honored, respected, revered, venerated by his disciples and nor do his disciples live in dependence on him and honoring and respecting him. Indeed, he is scorned by the scorn shown to his Dhamma. And some said this, this Michele Gosala, and this Ajita Kesakambalan, and this 
Pakudha Kachayana and this Sajaya Velatiputta. This Nigantha Natiputta is the head of this or that order, but he is not honored, respected, revered, venerated by the disciples, nor do his disciples live on dependence, independence on him, honoring and respecting him. Indeed, he is scorned by the scorn that was shown um, to his Dhamma. You have to remember now all of this Dhamma, their teaching is not by direct experience that the setup here in India is basically there's a guru and the guru speaks and you don't ask questions and you go away and think about what the guru said, but the guru knows and you don't. So these people are the ones that come into the parks and sit and question. The moment they question, there's going to be a debate that's not, you know, going to be conclusive. It's not going to be deductive reasoning. So what's happening now next is different. And some said this recluse Godama is the head of an order, the head of a group and the teacher of a group, well-known and famous founder of a sect regarded as by many as a saint. And he is honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples and his disciples live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. Once the recluse Godama was teaching his Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, and there was a certain disciple of his who cleared his throat. Thereupon, one of his companions in the holy life nudged him with his knee to indicate, be quiet, venerable sir, make no noise. The blessed one, the teacher is teaching us the Dhamma. And when the recluse Gotama is teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, on that occasion, there is no sound of his disciples coughing or clearing their throats. For then the large assembly is poised in expectancy. Let us hear the Dhamma the Blessed One is about to teach, just as though a man were at a crossroads pressing out pure honey and a large group of people were poised in expectancy. So too, when the recluse Gotama is teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of several hundred followers, on that occasion, there's no sound of his disciples coughing or clearing their throats or moving about. And then that large assembly is poised in expectancy. Let us hear the Dhamma the Blessed One is about to teach. And even those disciples of his who fall out with their companions in the holy life and abandon the training to return to the low life, even they praise the master and the Dhamma and the Sangha. They blame themselves instead of others saying, we were unlucky. We have little merit for though we, we went forth into the homelessness in such a well-proclaimed Dhamma, we were unable to live the perfect and pure holy life for the rest of our lives. Having become monastery attendants and lay followers, we undertake and observe the five precepts. And thus the recluse Gotama is honored, respected, revered, and venerated by his disciples. Then his disciples live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. But Udayan, how many qualities do you see in me because of which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me and live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me? Ah, venerable sir, I see five qualities in the Blessed One because of which his disciples honor, respect, revere, and, re and venerate him and live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. And what are the five you see? First, venerable sir, the blessed one eats little and commends eating little. And this I see as the first quality of the blessed one, because of which his disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate him and live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. And again, sir, the blessed one is content with any kind of robe and commends contentment with any kind of robe. And this I see as a second quality of the blessed one. 
And again, Venerable Sir, the Blessed One is content with any kind of alms food and commends contentment with any kind of alms food. And this I see as a third quality of the Blessed One. And again, Venerable Sir, the Blessed One is content with any kind of resting place and commends contentment with any kind of resting place. And this I see as a fourth quality of the Blessed One. And again, Venerable Sir, the Blessed One is secluded and commends seclusion. And this I see as a fifth quality of the Blessed One. Venerable Sir, these are the five qualities I see in the Blessed One, because of which his disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate him. And they live in dependence on him honoring and respecting him. Well, suppose, Udayan, my disciples honored, respected, revered, and venerated me, and lived in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me with the thought, the recluse go to me, eats little and commends eating little. Now there are disciples of mine who live on a cup full or half a cup full of food, a bilva of fruit, or half a bilv of fruits, quantity of food, while I sometimes eat the full contents of my alms bowl or even more. So if my disciples honored me with the thought, the recluse Godama eats little and commends eating little, then those disciples um, of mine who live on a cup full of food should not honor, respect, revere, and venerate me for this quality nor should they live in dependence on me honoring and respecting me for that reason. And suppose, Udayan, my disciples honored, respected, revered, and venerated me and lived in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me with a thought, the recluse Godama is content with any kind of robe and commends contentment with any kind of robe. Now, there are disciples of mine who are re refuse rag wearers and wearers of coarse robes, and they collect rags from the charnel ground, from rubbish heaps, pieces of cloth from shops, and make them into patched robes, and they wear them. But I sometimes wear robes given by householders, robes that are so fine that pumpkin hair is coarse by comparison. So if my disciples honored me with that thought, the recluse Godama is content with any kind of robe and commended contentment uh, with any kind of robe, then those disciples of mine who are the refuse wearers and the wearers of coarse robes should not honor, respect, revere, and venerate me for this quality, nor should they live in dependence on me honoring and respecting me. Suppose you die in my disciples honored, respected, revered, and venerated me and lived in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me with the thought the recluse Godama is content with any kind of alms food and commends contentment with any kind of alms food. Yet there are disciples of mine who are alms eaters who go on unbroken alms rounds from house to house who delight in gathering their food when they have entered among the houses. They will not consent even when invited to come in or sit down. But I sometimes eat on invitation meals of choice rice and many sauces and curries. And so if my disciples honor me with that thought, the recluse Godam is content with any kind of alms food and commends the contentment of any kind of alms food, well, then those disciples of mine who are alms eaters should not honor me, respect and revere and venerate me for this quality, nor should they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. And suppose who die in my disciples who honored, respected, revered and venerated me and lived in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me with the thought that recluse Godama is content with any kind of resting place and commends contentment with any kind of resting place. 
Now there are disciples of mine who are tree root dwellers and open air dwellers who do not use a roof for eight months of the year while I sometimes live in gabled mansions plastered within and without, protected against the wind, secured by door bolts, with shuttered windows for protection. So if my disciples honored me with that thought, the recluse go to miscontent with any kind of resting place and commends contentment for any kind of resting place then those disciples of mine who are tree root dwellers and open air dwellers, well, they should not honor, respect, revere, and venerate me for this quality, nor should they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. Suppose you die and my disciples honored, respected, revered, and venerated me and lived in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me with the thought that the recluse Gotama is secluded and commends periods on seclusion. Now, there are disciples of mine who are forest dwellers and dwellers in remote resting places who live withdrawn in remote jungle thicket resting places, return to the midst of the Sangha once each half month for the recitation of the Patimoka, the rules for the monks and guidance for living. But I sometimes live surrounded by bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, by men and women lay followers, by kings and king's ministers, by other sectarians and their disciples. So if my disciples honored me with that thought, the recluse Godama is secluded and commend seclusion, then these disciples of mine who are forest dwellers and so forth should not honor, respect, and revere and venerate me for this quality. Now, they should not, they, they should, nor should they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. You see, Udayan, it is not because of these five qualities that my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me and live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. However, Udayan, there are five qualities because of which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me and live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. So what are these five qualities? Now we go through a list that starts to look at the basic uh, framework structure and identifies five parts of the teaching structure of the Dhamma. First, before we go into the 37 requisites for awakening, the first one in the structure is the higher virtue. And this is where you're looking at the Dana Sila Bhavana in the beginning and forgiveness, as we pointed out to you, and then the Sila Samadhi Panya. But it's the virtue is predominantly the sila. Here, Udayan, my disciples esteem me for the higher virtue thus. The recluse Godama is virtuous. He possesses the supreme aggregate of virtue. And this is the first quality because of which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me. And they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. Now, we don't have to go into this very much because we look at the five uh, precepts, which we all know and we have looked at carefully and understood. And if you haven't done that, you need to let me know because we need to make sure you understand all the parts of the five. And the second part of the framework is knowledge and vision. This is extremely important. And when I bump into either layperson or monastic who doesn't realize, doesn't, never has heard of it, never heard of knowledge and vision, has only in modern times, has only heard about knowledge and wisdom. I think, how did this happen? But I'm spoiled. I know I'm not as afraid, ashamed of it. I'm spoiled because I was raised on the text first 
before being allowed to read anything else. And so I'm only looking in the purest sense that knowledge and vision was the declared method of teaching in the Buddhist meditation school that the Buddha ran. This is like a, float, a, a moving meditation school moving around, offering the teachings all based from the point of view from the Brahma Viharas and the other practices of meditation in teaching any part of the teaching. So when he's moving around, how does this school work? And it is mandatory when you come to his meditation school, you agree that you will learn through direct knowledge. And direct knowledge is the same thing as this knowledge and vision. And knowledge and vision was originally the name of the um, attainment of knowledge and vision of how things actually work or the true nature of how things operate. So this is knowledge and vision. Again, Udayan, my disciples esteem me for my excellent knowledge and vision. Thus, when the recluse Godama says, I know, he truly knows. And when he says, I see, he truly sees. The recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma through the direct knowledge. So here we're seeing the synony uh, synonymous use or of the uh, direct knowledge and knowledge and vision in this paragraph. Not without direct knowledge, he teaches the Dhamma with a sound basis. Not without a sound basis, he teaches the Dhamma in a convincing manner not in an unconvincing manner. Now, this statement that we just said, he teaches with a direct, uh, with a sound, uh, let's see, how did it work? Direct knowledge, not without direct knowledge, sound basis, not without sound basis, convincing manner, convincing manner. It means that he taught it in an easy way to understand. And always he teaches it throughout the text, he frameworks his um, suttas according to, why is it so consistent? Because he's always using the framework of the Four Noble Truths. He's always in these suttas. If you start, when you're reading any of the suttas, you pick them up, start reading them in the Majjhima Nikaya, and they are about the method and the teaching itself. It's not like visiting somebody to solve a problem because they're afraid of dying. It's not one of those suttas. It's one of the ones that's about the teaching. It will always be showing you first, the person's coming to him with a kind of suffering. And then they're going to talk about, he's going to talk about the cause of that. The person wants to know the cause of it. Then he's going to show the person a way out of this or a way to fix a situation. Even when he's talking to you about a problem you're having in your family at home, he's going to approach it this way, the way that we discussed the use of the Four Noble Truths and one of them was for peaceful reconciliation. Where you look at the problem, you discover, examine the cause of the challenge that's happening between the people. You then look at, um, the, uh, the, you've seen the cause of it, and then you, you look at the way it could be if there was no challenge, no problem between the people. You talk about that, and then you talk about a way to have a solution from the problem to come out of it. When you use the Four Noble Truths for reconciliation or a peaceful resolution in between people and stuff, at the end, the solution you talk about or you have them talk about, they think, the solution should be you challenge them to talk about their solution in terms of the eightfold path supporting them. So that's how the path comes into it and using right effort as the steps that actually fix the situation. The situation is X. We say the, it's a terrible situation and the, and the cause of it is X. And so we have to let go of X and relax about it in the present time and bring up Y, which is the, the solution. 
And then we have the Y has to be very wholesome. The X was very unwholesome and causing conflict. And then when we take the Y, then we carry that out. And I guess what you get is Z. I don't know because I didn't do well in algebra, but that's what you're doing or A, B, C or X, Y, Z. You see what's happening? Suffering, cause, solution is cessation and path. That's what he's doing for all of his teaching. The whole structure is set up that way. But that's why you hear Bhante teach and he's so consistent. And how do we sound consistent to you? Why? Because we were trained. He, he trained himself to, to try to, anytime he gives a talk, use these four pieces in the talk or three of them, the suffering, the cause, and the cessation of it and the way to the cessation of it was the is the six r's the right effort so this is the second quality the second quality is he's confirming to udayan i don't come to you to just talk and think about what this this is going to be how people come to you and they just talk and talk and talk and they never tell you how to get out of the problem you're talking about they just keep talking and nothing ever gets fixed Okay, but the Buddha is telling you he comes with direct knowledge, meaning I come to teach you something I already know, I've already seen. Then he teaches with a sound basis. He did it, he saw it, he realized the result. He can talk about the result because he's experienced it. And he teaches you in a convincing manner, which is organized by what? By the Four Noble Truths, every single time. It's the same organization. That's why he was so consistent and why he beat everybody in debates at that time. So the second quality is because of this and my disciples honor me for this reason. The third one is the higher wisdom. He's teaching the higher wisdom, okay? Now, Udayan, my disciples esteem me for the higher wisdom. The recluse go to miss is wise, he possesses the supreme aggregate of wisdom, and it is possible that he should not foresee the implications of any assertion, anything that they assert against him, he can go around it. How does he do this? Well, remember what we told you about the word wisdom, and now you get a chance to test it here. The word wisdom applies to dependent origination, if that's true, let's see if it's true. If that's true, then anytime you want to explain to something, somebody how they suffer, you can take them to the seven links that I showed you, seven links that I gave you, your, your practice chart, which is working. It's on those papers. I put it down near the bottom. It's in there showing you contact. The six sense doors have contact and then feeling, and then craving and clinging and habitual tendency for the reaction to be born and the suffering that happens afterwards. That's how this all works. Nobody else at that time was talking to anybody about it that way. Um, should not foresee the implications of an assertion or that he should not be able to, con uh, that he should not be able to confute. Confute means beat the person in a debate. That's what confute means. With reasons and current doctrines of others, what do you think? He doesn't have to use others. He uses his own experience to prove how things work. Udayan would, my disciples, knowing and seeing thus break in and interrupt me. No, venerable sir, they would not interrupt you. I do not expect instruction from my disciples. Invariably, it is my disciples who expect instruction from me. As a teacher, what we run into, sometimes people come to us wanting help. When they enter the door, they tell us everything they want us to do for them and how to do it. And that's where we have to find out if they're capable of actually being obedient. Now, I heard a had a, a wonderful thing I found yesterday discussing uh, and a little discussion from an, uh, an older teacher who's gone by now, he's not here anymore. And that discussion talks about the issue of the modern person 
being able to come to a teacher and actually embrace the concept of obedience because it's not in our nature and it's not in our cultures anymore. So it's extremely difficult and everything they're doing and saying and trying to push on you is coming from trying to grow up in a very complex society, a very competitive society full of um, lust and greed and jealousies and competition and all this stuff that's pressure pressures the person. You see, they're trying to grow up in that way and they, uh, they desperately struggle in life to be in control as they're going through so they can survive. I've been there, I've done that, I understand. They have, that I've lived in Washington DC for six years and worked. How could I not understand? You see, and had my own business for 14 years and I really understand. But there's always this pressure pushing on you to succeed, to say, I'm, this is what we're going to do. And then if I were to go to someone, a consultant, first thing I want to do is show you how I work things and how everything runs. And it, it takes me a long time to even listen to what they want to advise me. And if, you know, people in our society who face this a lot are um, ther people in therapeutics, psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, uh, mental therapists, you know, these people are faced with that. And, you know, when you go into therapy, you find yourself telling the same story over and over again, and they never point it out to you. Sometimes they don't. They're waiting for you to finally figure out that you're telling the same story over and over and over again. And maybe one day you'll stop and say, what do you think I should try, you know? And here are the Buddhists coming saying, basically, I do not expect from my disciples invariably, it is my instruction from them. It is my disciples who expect instruction from me. He's very strong teacher, very strong. He's not gonna listen. You can go sit down with him and tell him all this stuff, but then he's gonna show you where you're stuck and you're gonna start listening to him. The reason you're gonna stay with him and keep trying it is because um, he shows you how to see it for yourself. And he tells you right in the school, he tells you in the text somewhere, don't stay here in this school unless you keep asking questions and you can do what I'm asking you to do, follow instructions. Because everything I tell you the Buddha has uh, figured out, it's only going to work if you only do his instructions. If you add anything else to it, it's like French pastry. <laughs> the person who is the French chef that does the French pastry is one of the highest paid chefs in France because they know exactly how much you can touch the dough and squeeze it. And then it comes out flaky and really, really light, you know? And you wanna pound it like making bread <laughs> and that's not it. And you have to follow their instructions if you're going to ever make pastry, you know, it's a secret. You have to follow the Buddhist instructions and wonderful things can happen. Wonderful things. This is the third quality. So he expects them to come and take it, the instruction from them. The fourth one is the Four Noble Truths. We look at that. Udayan, when my disciples have met with suffering, um, have met me with suffering and become victims of suffering and pray to suffering, they come to me. They ask me about the noble truth of suffering and being asked, I explain to them the noble truth of suffering. I satisfy their minds with my explanation. They ask me about the, the noble truth of the origin of suffering. And they, uh, I explain to them the noble truth of the origin of suffering and satisfy their minds with explanation. And uh, the noble truth of cessation, again, I explain to them the noble truth of cessation and satisfy their minds with explanations. And then uh, being asked, I explain to them the noble truth about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And I satisfy their minds with my explanation. And this is the fourth quality because of which my disciples honor me. <clears throat> now, the fifth one is really getting into the way to develop the wholesome states. And the way he's really saying the way to let go of the unwholesome states and embrace the wholesome states. 
Now, I, in looking at this, I've gone over this about three, four times, yes, last night until today and gone through re-editing what I gave you. So you had something because I, I really wanted to dive into this. I was already planning to come and teach you about this and you chose the sutta I was gonna use. So we're right on, right tuned into each other. Um, what in the world was the Buddha about? He was about balance. He was not about um, forcefully overcoming anything and making anything happen. And I think we get lost about this sometimes. I told someone once, uh, it just came to me what this is all about, is what are you attempting to do? You're attempting to experience, when you sit in meditation, you are attempting to experience something, but you're attempting to experience an experience of no experience. That is what you're trying to do. Why? There are many, many medical reasons why, many medical reasons why, because of the lightness on the heart, the circulatory system, the digestive system, the sleeping system, the parts of the brain, the pressure on the brain, the heart, all these systems and circulatory issues and your bones and everything. This is why you're doing that. And Jill Bowton Taylor had to have a stroke in order to experience what I'm talking about. If you go and listen to the story of Jill Bolton Taylor, it's a TED talk. Go and listen to what happened to her. She shut down the side of her brain, which was doing all the thinking and computation and formulation and, think, and, and uh, bringing up all the past uh, memories and all of the complications and remembering all the difficulties she ever had in her whole life. And it just turned off. Unfortunately, she had to do this by having a stroke. I have many times said to Bonte, can't we call her and tell her she could come and do it again without having a stroke? Because what she described in that talk is what you can experience if you come and learn how to do this property properly, but without hurting your body at all, without causing any uh, discomfort or hurting your body at all. This is what um, you can do, okay? So the four, we're looking now at what they call the, uh, okay, so what he's basically doing, go back for a second, his teaching is all about letting go of the unwholesome mind states that have been causing difficult kinds of patterns of behavior. And when you let them go, that's not enough to change anything for a long period of time. You have to really understand that. You have to replace them when you let go of them. You have to bring up the wholesome and keep that going and identify in our observation of what's happening. How do I feel? How does this work? How does it work with people and everything else? When I embrace something wholesome, and I now know what that feels like. Can I keep going with other things that feel similar to that in the wholesome side of things? And what you're doing is the second part of this is you are learning as a human being the power you can have by learning to communicate with your brain. Communicate, you and the brain. Communicate. That's what you're learning how to do. But the way that you're communicating with the brain is not saying, okay, brain, you're my slave and I want you to do what I want you to do now. That's not it at all. What you're trying to do is be very gentle with, believe it or not, this childlike brain that's in your head that has been covered up and almost suffocated by what you have turned into as an adult human being. But if you look at children, the kids out back are playing all day long, screaming, squealing, and discussing and fighting, but also 
playing and planning and building things in the backyard. And they're all getting along and they go from one thing to another. And when they leave this one, that's done. And they're now doing this one and that's done. And they don't hold grudges and tomorrow they're gonna to be out there again. The littlest one, the smallest one, squeals and screams sometimes just to get attention to make people listen to him because he's so small. But the others are playing and they're all good to him and they take care of him. And this is really, a classroom out my window here into this backyard next door. And anytime I wanna see how do people really operate at younger age, the thing I can watch and I can see is they do something and then they leave it. But we don't, we don't. If Su Huang gets mad at me and she yells at me, I bet you by noontime, I'd probably tell 15 people about it, <laughs> you know? And then at night when I go home, I'm going to still recount that story because I forget maybe the past and I'm carrying it with me. And then I'm not in the present time and I'm using up my energy struggling every time I don't let things go. And I watch these kids, they don't get tired all day long. At night, they're just as full of energy as they were in the morning. And that's why, because they, the brain has not been managed and taught yet to hold on to everything. That's why we're in trouble in the world. Anyway, so let's look at these. these when we go into this, we're going into the description. The way to develop wholesome states is to fully and completely meet and greet and understand who the 37 requisites of enlightenment are. And I'll try to talk to you as we go along. Why, you know, everybody goes here. Why are they repeated sometimes in the different groups? Why? And we'll figure this out. So the first one is the four foundations of mindfulness. And I really like this. Um, I like this uh, paragraph a whole lot because this right here is the summation of the actual lesson the person is supposed to learn from the Satipatthana Sutta, the four foundations of mindfulness part. This is the summation of it. So, Odayan, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four foundations of mindfulness. Here, a monk abides contemplating what? contemplating the body as a body. That's all. Contemplating a body as a body and nothing else. Ardent, fully aware, mindful, mindfully doing that, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. He abides contemplating feeling as feeling. Ardent, fully aware, mindful, having put away covetous and grief for the world. He contemplating the mind as mind, mind as mind. Fully aware that that's all it is. Observing it, mindful means observing it. And that's all they can find is mind as mind. That's what it is. Having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Desire and anger and any kind of grief, just putting it away and coming in as close as you can to the mind. And all you're going to find when you look at the mind is what? Mind. That's it. And then he's contemplating mind objects as mind objects. Mind objects, the big body of thoughts, arising thoughts. Okay. Ardent, fully aware, mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world. Thereby my disciples and of mine, the disciples of mine uh, have reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. Ah, what did he say there? They, they, uh, they have abided and reached the consummation of perfection of no direct knowledge. Ah, direct knowledge is figuring out mind is mind. That's all. No more adjectives, no flowing sentences, no paragraphs of explanation, nothing. That's all. And those four things are also impersonal. That's part of what you're figuring out. 
they are just what they are and nothing else. Second one, four kinds of right striving. Udaya and I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four right kinds of striving. Here, a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. Now, the one thing about this, this is the formula for right effort, and right effort and right striving are the same thing. The same paragraph describes them in every sutta. And what we have to look at this very closely because we understand what it means now if you've been practicing with us. But if somebody comes here and they've never been with us before and they look at this, they can get lost in another meaning for effort if they don't under, truly understand this from experiencing it. So what do I mean? When I go back and try to figure out how is it that it ever happened that right effort got lost in translation. How did that happen? Let's look at the words even Bhikkhu Bodhi uses here. Enthusiasm is all right. Zeal means enthusiasm. The reason we traditionally change that to, to enthusiasm instead of zeal is because zeal is a Christian who goes around wanting to convert everybody. And we don't want to say seal because there's too much of that happening to separate ourselves away from anything like that. We just want to understand what it means is you have enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. Your enthusiasm for the non-arising, it doesn't mean that you try to stop them from arising. That's the trick here. If you embrace, I have to be concerned, have enthusiasm for non-arising. A lot of people will take that and say, I have to have enthusiasm to make the unarisen evil and wholesome states stop. So I have to push them down, subdue them, suppress them and make them not arise. That's not right. It's all wrong. And when that happens, why do I say it's wrong? Because it doesn't take you to path because it doesn't help you go down the path. It's the only reason the Buddha ever said something was right or wrong. And here I will pronounce that it's not right because you can try to push something down and subdue it while you're in retreat and go along maybe for 10 days or even 30 days. As soon as you go home, all the stuff that bothered you is gonna start coming back and it's going to start to uh, depress you that you feel you didn't do something right. And the problem was you struggled against anything that was arising. What are the unarisen, unwholesome states? They are the hindrances. And what have we taught you about the hindrances from, I think it's about, I think we have 11 suttas now. I think there's 11 of them by now that are explaining to you what feeds a hindrance. I do. My personal attention feeds a hindrance, makes it bigger, stronger, and stay there with you longer. So if I stop feeding it, what will happen? It will start to fade away. It won't come anymore to get fed because you're not, the brain is not going to pay attention anymore. So to have the non-arising for the uh, enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen evil unwholesome states, I just told you the answer. How do we do that? If you have the knowledge of the operation of a hindrance, where do you find that? Okay, page 1597 in the Samyutta Nikaya under the discussions heading, you go there and read three pages of a discussion which explains to you what will allow the enlightenment factors to arise and what will keep them from arising. Okay, and if you feed the hindrances, they cannot arise and help you. And if you don't feed the hindrances, your attention, which is the food, then the enlightenment factors will arise and you have a chance of going down the path completely. 
arousing energy, arousing energy, yes, but for the suppression or subduing of these things, no, you're arousing your energy just like you would in any meditation practice so you can keep going with this the right way. Exerting your mind, ah, exerting your mind sounds forceful, but if you have knowledge of how this all works, exerting your mind means you use your mind to remember how this works. And therefore, you know the knowledge about the hindrances and what feeds them. And therefore, you stop feeding them and let go and strive. Then he awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of the unarisen uh, evil and wholesome states. Okay? You let, that means that you let them go and you relax. And you're setting yourself up for not having those states come up again because now you know what they're like and you know how they operate. You have this direct knowledge. He awakens enthusiasm for the arising of unarisen wholesome states. You bring up a wholesome state, okay? And then you also awaken your enthusiasm for that and make an effort and energy to make that happen and exert your mind to follow the six Rs. And he awakens uh, for the, uh, the enthusiasm for the continuation, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment of, by development of arisen wholesome states. Once you experience a smile, all you have to do is smile. Just smile. And you know how that feels. Don't do anything tomorrow that doesn't feel like that. And if you accidentally do something or say something or do some action, catch yourself because it feels wrong. Smile, laugh at it, forgive yourself, take a look at what you did. Don't do it again. If it was adverse to a precept, let it go. Relax, smile, and come back. You'll get right in line again. But don't carry around being angry at yourself that you slipped. Forgive yourself. Be kind to yourself. You're learning about compassion. Have compassion for yourself. He makes, uh, he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives, and thereby many disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. So he's telling you, when you experience this the right way, you are attaining direct knowledge. How do you know you are? At, uh, applying it properly. How? Because you're changing mind. You're retraining your mind. Every time you practice these four uh, steps of right effort or four kinds of striving properly, which is the six R cycle. What is the six R cycle doing? Twim is purifying your mind from the unwholesome to the wholesome, and it is retraining the mind. It's helping you remember every time you let go of something, you must replace it and then keep going with something new that is wholesome. And the brain finally gets it. And when the brain gets it, you flip into automatic. That's what happens to my students when they actually take this in life and use it all the time. They call me, what happened? They said, I used to get so upset if this woman got mad at me at the office and now I'm not getting mad. What's wrong with me? I said, nothing's wrong with you. <laughs> nothing's wrong with you. All of a sudden your six R's worked. The right effort clicked in because why? Why do you suppose that happened? It happened because the brain is comfortable and it likes it. Your brain wants to be comfortable. That's what's happening. Next one is four bases of spiritual power. This one's pretty easy. I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four bases of spiritual power. The bhikkhu or the monk or the student develops bases of spiritual power consisting in Productive concentration due to enthusiasm and a determined striving. 
means you continue doing your meditation systematically, you keep doing it. And you develop a basis for spiritual powers to occur and develop in you by setting up a productive concentration. Always stick that word in there before, before con, con, um, concentration. If you're gonna say concentration, it has to be a productive level of concentration, not too tight, not too loose. It has to be the kind of concentration that allows you to keep moving down the path, doesn't block you. He develops the basis for spiritual uh, power consisting concentrate productive concentration due to purity of mind and determined striving so purification i just told you every time you do practice the six r cycle you are purifying your mind and you are retraining your mind okay then he develops the basis of spiritual power consisting of productive concentration due to investigation and determined striving Never give up in your meditation, curiosity and persistence. They are like the two spare players that work with the seven factors of enlightenment that sit on the bench and wait to jump in and help whoever has the ball. You've got seven people playing on the floor and Curiosity and persistence are right there and you apply them and you'll keep meditating longer. Okay, <clears throat> now the five faculties. Again, Udayan, I have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop these five spiritual faculties. A monk or a student develops the faculty of faith, which leads to peace, leads to enlightenment. Now, faith in Buddhism is not an unbased belief. It is simply saying, I have faith uh, that the, the Buddha did find something, that there, this practice can work. It's that kind of faith, just like it's the same kind of faith I put in a cycling coach who was training me to go across a state 270 or 300 miles. And I had to turn myself over to him to train me how to ride long distance. It is the same thing I would do with a sailing instructor when they were training me to sail alone on a boat in the ocean instead of the bay and come back in the bay after sailing in the ocean. The faith you put that way, you put with the Buddha at the beginning, and that's good enough to say, I'm going to do this long enough to see if it works. And usually it starts working right away, so you're hooked, <laughs> you know, and you really want to do it. Okay, it's easy to get going if you follow the instructions. It's immediately effective and it keeps inviting deeper inspection. And that's what we're hunting for here. If you're pursuing what the Buddha actually taught, go back to that saying, something that was easy to understand, something that's immediately effective when I leave after learning it and I can use it all the time. It's immediately effective. It's something, uh, something that is not touched by time. And it's constantly inviting deeper inspection because I find out how it works and I want to know more. And you're just like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> you want to know how deep does the rabbit hole go and you want to dive in. Go on, dive in. Nothing's going to hurt you. You're going to find out some wonderful things if you take a hold of this teaching and keep using it all the time. The second one is the energy. That's up to you. Each human being 
has energy in their body meat takes energy to sit in meditation it's just because you're sitting still doesn't mean you're using up energy you're asking the spine to stay straight and not snooping down you know hold your head up keep your spine decently don't lean back in your chair don't press the energy in your back and stop it from flowing energy is very important anatomically in the body to get this right, if you're sitting on the floor, find your three point balance position if you're sitting on the floor with your legs crossed. If your knees are hurting, put little tiny blow up pillows under the knees to get the knees high enough to not be stressing out the hips in the way that you're sitting. Because if you stress your hips, then it's connected to the backbone and the backbone's connected to the neck bone and the neck bone gives you a headache in the head bone and there you go. You're all hooked together. So you have to pay attention to how you're hooked together and not set it off to run up through your body. You find your balancing point and you find your comfort point with as little pain as possible. Okay, the faculty of mindfulness is just the faculty uh, of your observation skill. And we explain uh, mindfulness. We do not drift around with mindfulness, questioning how to explain it. The mindfulness is if it's sharp, you're watching very carefully, even if it's pitch dark like it is right here. And uh, you can't see my rulers here and it disappears. I'm up here in the black. You know? <laughs> okay. It's a very sharp observation where your curiosity and persistence has to jump in and help you when you get to nothingness because there's nothing there and it irritates a lot of people. And you have to laugh at that and let it go and keep being curious. But what is nothingness? What is that? You see? And you keep watching. And I told you there was a school teacher. I love her. She was only like a fourth grade school teacher in South Korea, I think it was fourth grade seven hours and she just kept watching you see and she felt this little tiny movement and with 6r and the brain started 6ring actually the brain started doing it automatically letting it go she came out she would come to your interview like this and she would talk to us in a tiny little voice like this how'd it go how long did you sit six and a half. Oh, I'm sitting in the back of the room taking notes, six and a half hours, seven hours. And she's actually watching, really obediently watching everything. That's your mindfulness, concentration, productive concentration. You always have to be careful. What makes you tired physically and mentally is too much concentration. It can also cause ringing in your ears. It can cause headaches. You have to really relax and let go. And this is uh, sort of the opposite of what we hear sometimes being taught. Just try it. Just relax, let go, relax. Uh, you know, re-smile, relax, smile, and come back. Take that and say, I'm gonna relax, smile, and come back. I'm gonna let it go relax, smile, and come back. That's what you have to say to yourself. And you keep doing that when you have to. Next one is wisdom and wisdom. What does it mean when you are doing this, even in the deepest states, dependent origination is occurring all the time. So if you were to become concerned with something in the dark, in the deeper states, how does this happen? How does this pull you in one or the other directions? You sense it internally or you see it, it's mostly seeing something, even just wiggle. You remember everything you learned about the hindrances, don't feed it at all, don't even give it a second thought and you let it go, relax, smile and come back as fast as you can. You're just telling brain, this is my life. You know, this, this show, this is your life. I think this is your life, Buddha. <laughs> I see what you saw, what was happening. Relax, smile, come back. Relax, smile, come back. Relax, smile, come back. That's it. And finally, nothing inside you moves at all. And you 
you fall into this deep open state? Nothing. So wisdom is seeing the dependent origination taking place that you saw something. And if you did move at all, what happened before you moved is what it'll happen again. Watch it closer next time. Watch it at the bottom. When something does move inside a dark area like that, a state, what happens before it moves? And what happened before that? These are the deep questions we'll ask you in interviews. I won't even tell you. Sorry, not going to tell you. You have to tell me someday. Okay, thereby many disciples abide with me because when these five faculties are operating effectively, then they lead to in peace and lead to enlightenment. And the disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation of perfection of this direct knowledge. That means consummation of perfection of direct knowledge here in the five faculties, you have met them, you have greeted them, you understand who they are. And when you finish your sitting, it is very wise for you to keep just checking these five. What did I do with them? Was there enough of this, 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 and this? Now we look at the five powers and we can all blink because the five powers simply mean the brain has got it and it's going to take over. You will never again have to come out of your session and check these five things because guess what? I've learned how to do it. I heard you. <laughs> I learned how to do it. I know I can do it. I can do it. You don't have to do it anymore. I got it. <laughs> I don't have to do it anymore. That's right. I'm going to do it. That's right. The brain is going to do it. It's a very good sign when he's taking care of it um, for you, okay? So these become these powers of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, the right balance, the right recipe, everything's perfect. Next one, seven factors of enlightenment and um, the... Um, I'm going to go into read you. I'm not going to read you this section. You can you can read it yourself, but I'm going to go into where the paper is on this. It's in the large document that I gave you. Okay. And when we look at um, I'll put you up here, right? Okay. When I, when I look at this document and I go down inside it to find the um, spiritual power, for basis spiritual power. Oh, right, we did that. Five faculties, five powers. Here you go. Listen carefully. The spiritual demonstration and questions consume their mind concerning why there is so much suffering all around us in life. Curiosity finally gets the better of them and arouses the meditator to go and find a teacher, a guide who can help them go down the path. The first study, they first study what mindfulness is according to the suttas. And then they begin to practice investigation into how things actually work. As they proceed, they will demonstrate a persistence in continuing their investigation and keep, they keep it going. Next one picks up on their energy and they put it into this act of investigation. And this then results in reaching a level of altruistic joy or empathetic joy. Joy plays an important role in the successful meditation. Joy acts as a mechanism aiding the balance one seeks, which has to do with these seven factors of enlightenment. And during meditation, more joy will improve mindfulness, investigation, and boost the energy. Less joy will result in helping tranquility, collectedness of mind, and favor the evolution of equanimity. But when joy fades away, tranquility arises anyway. And following tranquility, there is the realization of a collected presence of mind. 
stillness or unification of mind, a particular level, and it should say productive concentration is there. A particular level of productive concentration. Mind remains light and agile while observing closely what occurs in deeper states. As the meditator continues, they reach a state of balance of mind and that is unprecedented in their experience of which there is no prior incidence to compare this to, not in their life anywhere, this, this kind of steadiness. And this is called the state of equanimity. And this is the meditator's first experience where the mind is able to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think most anything without becoming disturbed, without moving in any way unnecessarily, without being restless. And at this point, the meditator has reached the doorway to the imperturbable of which the Buddha spoke in so many of his suttas. And this is a mind that absolutely cannot be disturbed. And that is what your equanimity actually is when you get to it, you see. That is a mind that cannot be disturbed. And I mean, sincerely, someone can come up and blow off a gun, shoot a gun, or they're an accident. You know, there was a, um, I forget where I was. I think it was New York City when that happened. And many people were just screaming and yelling and all upset on the sidewalk, but I had heard the accident happen too. And I didn't jump at all. And two cars came into each other and a third one crashed into that in an intersection. But it was just like a bang, bang, bang. And then it was happening. But I realized what Bonte was teaching me was a kind of presence of mind where stuff just doesn't, it doesn't jump the way it did before. And so you have situations where you can be a lot more confident about things going in to talk to people about who are important to help some other people solve some kind of problem or something and everybody's afraid of talking to anybody, it doesn't bother me. You want me to go talk to the moon? I'll go talk to the moon, it's okay. <laughs> moon is the moon. <laughs> you know, this is where your mind goes with using this in life. And real equanimity is very different from indifference. And when somebody flippantly says, oh, equanimity, that's just an indifference to something. No, no, it's not. Indifference means you have no mindfulness functioning properly. No observation, proper kinds of observation going connected with knowledge. And equanimity means there's a perfect level of observation that is functioning. There's mindfulness is perfect. That's where equanimity is, but indifference is there's no mindfulness, you see, with knowledge. So you think about that for a while and see if you can see if you can see how that that alters it's different. Okay. Next one here. I'll read this section really quickly. I proclaim to my disciples the way to develop the seven factors of enlightenment. A bhikkhu develops the mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion. And I add a word here because I don't know how it didn't happen, but it should be there. Um, supported by seclusion, disenchantment, dispassion, and cessation results in a relinquishment. Dispassion, I'm sorry, it, disenchantment and dispassion are two different levels. And if you're running a line like this, it's always there. So I stuck it in. Uh, he develops the investigation of states, enlightenment factor, and the investigation of states is how are they operating. So by you understanding dependent origination and understanding the seven co-arising links from your process chart, you understand you can watch the investigation of states, how all the states arise, how they exist and they disappear and how you get involved in them. All those answers are coming from your knowledge of dependent origination. 
the joy enlightenment factor supported by seclusion, disenchantment, dispatch, and, and cessation. Now, remember when you're talking this sutta, you're talking about training situation. So that's why they're talking so much about seclusion and developing, it, that's the best place for you to develop it the first time and find out what it actually is in, the seclu in a secluded situation. And you see first disenchantment with a lot of the vibrant, you know, not vibrant, but uh, active energy type things that you do in your life, you're not interested in it as much. And you get to a place where seclusion actually means it's fine for me to sit in the middle of traffic in an intersection by a light on a sidewalk and do a meditation session. It's fine. Because by then you know that a sound is just a sound. Anything you feel is just a, uh, just a feeling. And you know that anything that you taste is just a taste. And at that point, it doesn't matter where you sit, whether you're in a train terminal, an airport, or in the busy traffic area, or right when all the offices empty out for people to go home. It doesn't matter anymore. You can sit anywhere. Tranquility enlightenment factor. And this is the calm, calming factor. And then the productive concentration enlightenment factor or collectedness of mind and the equanimity enlightenment factor supported by sec uh, seclusion, disenchantment, dispassion and cessation results in relinquishment. And thereby many disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge. So again, Odayan, I have proclaimed, this is the last one, I have proclaimed for you the Eightfold Path. And since this is just barely mentioned, I mean, we've done it before, but I'm gonna take you into the, um, the document again, because, right, I think it's the next one. Um, Right. And there's this, I wrote, oh, that's not where it is. Wait a minute. I must have given it to you on the attachment. I, I, did I put the attachment in here? I'm not sure. I guess it's the other. Okay. Okay. It's the other document. Just a minute. Um, let me go in there again. Here we go. It, I, that's one of the reasons I gave you this, because in this particular sutta, um, this memorization page gives you a short version of the, uh, of the Eightfold Path that's good enough for us, because most of us have gone through this a lot. To the right view, Samaditi is accomplished through the practice of a harmonious perspective. You don't think taking things personally. That's the biggest part of that one, is understanding what happens if you change your perspective and devote yourself for a few days to checking whenever you say anything, do anything, are involved in anything. Are you taking it personally or are you approaching it impersonally? To, to approach it personally is about me, mine, and myself. To approach it impersonally is to embrace anatta perspective. And it's showing you how you can practice giving up atta and having anatta more important. Right thought is samasamkapa, um, accomplished through the practice of harmonious imaging. What's in your mind? And this is an active thing. Can you keep in your mind wholesome images? And if a bad one slips in, can you let it go, relax, smile, come back and put a new one in there? And that's how you use your six Rs with this. Right speech is samawacha accomplishing it through practicing harmonious communication. Well, the point here is we communicate wholesomely through using our body, speech, and mind. Somebody says, what do you mean we just speech? That's just speech. No, no, it's not. And anybody who's been a mother is going to argue with you because most mothers, if they have more than one child, uh, they definitely have established with those children uh, the mother's voice. And if you go out and say, you need to come inside now, your dad is 
almost home. They're going to come right in. They have the mother's speech. You don't do it that way. We asked you not to. That's the mother's voice. But it's also her body and posture. And sometimes my best friend had a great mother's voice. But she all she had to do was put her arms on her hips and stand in the door and tilt her head. And she didn't have to say anything. And there had five kids came right in. That was it. Right action, sama kamanta, accomplished through practicing harmonious movement of mind's attention. Now this list of eightfold path, remember this is designed for you in training to apply to your meditation, also to life, but it's designed just to speak very simply. Harmonious movement of mind's attention is where is your mind's attention? This is a um, volitional point and volition is choice. Where do you decide to place your mind's attention? On the anger that you have towards what the person said to you, or is it on forgiving them and using compassion to give them a little bit of space to say, to go off at you in a COVID living situation where everybody's together and you just let the persons go and then say something off the subject that's very nice and sweet right afterwards, changes everything. Right livelihood, sama ajiva, fulfilled by practicing harmonious lifestyle. Now this one, the way I talk about this is setting up a life uh, living situation that is supportive for the precepts, your precepts to be kept all the time and practice for pre preparation for life, meaning eating, sleeping, having uh, in, you know social intercourse with people. And then um, uh, also your spiritual development. So that means setting up a living space where there's a tiny corner somewhere or a tree that you can sit in by your underneath by yourself. Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna disturb you. You you set it up so you can have personal time. Right effort, Samawayama's practice as harmonious observation. Um, I'm sorry, that's that was not right. Harmonious. Um, how did we do this? <laughs> something slipped here harmonious right effort is harmonious practice whoops I'm just going to put the six R's after that four steps of right effort to purify and retrain, retrain your mind. Mm. I don't know, let's see where this one goes. I didn't catch this before. Right, mindfulness is accomplished by practicing a, um, that's what it is, um, harmonious. I didn't catch this, I can't believe it. Huh observation whoops uh oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> what a mess I got myself in now. <laughs> okay, let's go back a minute. Um, I don't know how I did that. Okay, well, somebody has to read out loud the last one because I don't have it. I can probably do it for you though, wait a second. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, you're right, mindfulness is your observation. And it's observing the movements of mind's attention. And um, then your right concentration is the last one that's on there. And there was an explanation for you there. It's applying the proper- you stop sharing? I couldn't, I can't fix it. I don't know what I did to it. Okay. 
I, I'm not sure. So I, I don't know how to fix it, how to get back to it the other way. See it? It's stuck. One of the things they took away from the modern computers that I really loved about the older computers was that um, you could always get this little thing here. Let me see if it works. There we go, I did it, okay. So right, mindful, uh, right uh, mindfulness is um, good observation of what mind's doing and taking action using the six R's. I don't know if this is gonna work. I'll do it this way, harmonious. Mm. Okay. Well, you know, it was back in six, uh, 2004, so I'm not going to get mad at myself too much. So you had right effort, you had um, uh, <laughs> okay. There you go. So I'm probably going to have to resend this last page. Uh, and then the last one is um, right under nutrition. I bet this is like that. Is that right? Somebody has to tell me if I'm right or not. Samasati. Acquiring a perfect quality and level of, I should say, productive concentration support, clear observation. Okay. Okay. So um, I believe that's there. So now I want to open up this to questions and see where you want to go because the last part of the sutta. <laughs> I'm going to go over it in a different meeting. I want to ask you questions. Uh, hear you ask me questions about this, because um, the uh, we can on the next part we do. I'm willing to talk to you about the eight liberations. Uh, what that's added in later and comes from basically comes more like from commentary, but the way it's set up. Um, and then go into what they're talking about is really restating again and again. But this section in the back, nine and 10, is getting into casinas. And all I was going to say to you, really, we don't have to go into this because I won't talk to you very much about casinos because we understand the casinas are used in the absorption meditation and that the purpose of them is to learn to have the mind learn to fixate on a point. And by teaching your mind to close and point. So we do not find in the, there's two things about casinas. I can tell you from my experience with talking to older monks about this, 
There are very few places left on the earth that actually teach the casinas the way they were originally taught. And that's number one. Number two, Bonte doesn't feel it's a good thing for people in this particular time to be concentrating and one pointing on something that develops that when all of the release and success and movement down the path is coming from teaching you how to let go and relax your mind and retrain it to obey you. So you're learning this communication system with your mind. And that's about all I'm going to actually talk about with the casinas. And then um, it described the 10 casinas that were used. But it, it, you know, if you want to experience what this is like, um, the example that all of us can relate to in life, when you were a kid, did you ever get interested in lying in your bed and looking at the light bulb? Okay, look at the light bulb and then close your eyes and there's an image. And you can actually move that image and keep it from fading away and continue to watch that image inside. What I'd like you to do if you play around with this, just to test what I'm saying, notice how the, you're putting stress on the brain to do that. You're putting attention on the brain to do that, to, to keep it from fading away and stay there as long as it can. But this was the, the um, preparation, a preparation kind of exercise that um, we can't find anything that's talking about it taking you to the path and down the path and that sort of thing. We're, we're looking at this and saying this is written from the reflection from the Vasudhimaga and absorption angle of things. That's the thing we're looking. So when I looked at, when I read over the jhana section, I can see that it's still giving us the descriptions that we want to see for the different breaks in the different levels when we're going from one jhana to another, okay? Um, but it's different. So what I want to do is I want to work on this a little bit and I'm happy to do the rest of it next week if you all are interested, but you need to let me know if you're really interested in doing the rest of this. Then you go in, you go past this, um, you're looking at the supernormal powder powers before we look at those. There's two things about these, these supernormal powers that you need to be familiar, you need to know about, okay? First of all, all the Arahats didn't have all of these superpowers developed. That's one of the fallacies that came out in the stories. And we know from examining the texts more closely, we're gonna find somebody who had all of them, who is Mogalana, Maha Mogalana. He comes, shows up and has the divine ear, understands the minds of others, has recollection of uh, past lives, has uh, the, um, divine eye and divine ear operative okay and has complete recollection of past life. he has everything okay and then you have the buddha he had everything but then amongst the arahats themselves some of them would develop a divine ear to to communicate with devas that were protecting them and things like that and get advice but always remember <laughs> no offense but uh devas are not cooperative as far as coming down and actually washing the dishes for you when you have cooked the dinner for five kids and you're exhausted. <laughs> you know, uh, these devas can give you advice about remember Anicca, wash the dishes and go to bed and take some rest. Just remember when you're washing all those dishes that it has an end, <laughs> but the Dave is not going to show up. There's many times, you know, we in, in the Christian, in the Christian world, we had the Holy Ghost and um, you know, you could develop a really nice relationship with the idea of the Holy Ghost being there with you. When everybody was fighting in the living room and things were falling apart in an emergency, you could actually believe somebody else was there that was comforting and supporting you. And it was a great, great idea. But I used to actually tell the reverend at my church uh, that I tried real hard to develop my relationship with the Holy Ghost. The problem was, I really wanted that guy to show up and help me in that house sometimes. And he was never there. He never came, you know? But I'd go to sleep and say thank you and all of that was very nice. But um, divine ear is actually a communication thing that goes on like channeling and people who have a sense for this, it will fall into place when the mind gets free of everything 
the person has a tendency to be able to channel a lot easier. And then channeling is simply done by communication with divine ear. And you're not talking out loud, you're communicating uh, inside with the person. Understanding the minds of others, Bhante has often told me is not a gift. Because the problem with this is if you start to develop the ability to read other people's minds, if you're not around a guiding teacher, and an old, old monk told me the same thing in Sri Lanka, you're in for a lot of trouble. It can exhaust you and wipe you out because you don't know how to control it once it opens. And Bhante would say this is the same thing is true uh, with the third eye. The third eye is an actual thing, but you do not want to go in, an, in India. You can pay $3,000 to go have this young person teach you how to open your third eye. And my advice is put it as a down payment on a house or something. Don't do that. Don't do that because you're not going to stay around that person and they're not going to be able to advise you how to turn it off if you turn it on. That's the problem. You see? So another part about these itty powers um, is that the story goes that there were a bunch of monks um, and some of them knew how to do the itty powers. And the people heard that they, people in the village heard that they were able to do these things. And so they confronted the monks and they said, if you're so smart, then why don't one of you just go right up that flagpole and get that thing on the top and bring it down and just show us how you are. Just fly up there and then get it and slide down the pole. And nobody thought anybody would do it. And Mogalana jumped forward and said, just did it in front of them. Well, it got back to the Buddha that he did this. And this is the sad part that goes on even today with people who can do one or two of these things and start talking about it and letting people know. And then people flood them and they come to see them do that. Now, do we have to go back through this whole lesson to see what it was that the monks were supposed to respect the Buddha for? And the Buddha was upset because when you start doing something like that in the open in front of people who don't understand what this is, that's the only reason they're going to come is to see you walk through a wall or walk through a mountain or dive in the earth and come up in Japan and have a talk with somebody and dive in the earth and come back and you can do it. Well, whoopie doo is what I say, whoopie doo. Having one of these is not so bad, but having them all start to open up on you, Mogolana was quite something. He could fly, he could go through walls, he could pass his arm through solid things. He had mastered the elements. All of these things were operating with him. So he was the sensitive one where that would work. And Sariputta was the intellectual personality. And none of these things would work for Sariputta didn't get into the itties at all. He may have had a couple things, but I haven't found it yet uh, that he's had any predominant thing going on. So that's all you can say about uh, But uh, in the suttas, many places they have mentioned that uh, Sariputta also had all of those itties, but uh, which Mughalana had, but uh, he is considered to be more of an intellectual and uh, with wisdom and uh, Mughalana is considered, but he had all the itties. Uh, whatever the list of these was there. Okay, if he, if he had them, he was behaving. Maybe they came in after he said that. <laughs> he was behaving. <laughs> Mogolana yeah. was just fun and frolic, you know. Sure, I need a I need a Japanese apple. Okay, just a minute. Down in the earth, get the apple. Come back out. Here's your apple. <laughs> You know, uh, Mogolana was constantly getting it. Now, see, Mogolana did something once. The story goes, he, he was on top of a mountain with three monks. I love this story. I, we did a painting on a wall, and then a storm came and took away the painting after we were finished. But we had this mountain, and you imagine the three monks are up there with Mogolana. And down in the valley below, the Buddha is sitting uh, in a nice spot under a beautiful tree, and he's meditating. And Mogolana saw that he did not want this dragon that was flying around. The Chinese love this one. The dragon is flying around in the air and it's, 
it's trying to entice the Buddha to stop meditating. Nobody really knows if the Buddha was sitting somewhere near the dragon eggs where he had his egg, she had her eggs or what was going on, you know, but it kept doing that. And the monks said, what are you going to do about this? We have to stop. He's going to bother the Buddha. Nobody should bother the Buddha while he's sitting in meditation. And Mogalana said, not a problem. And he flew up in the air and he grabbed the dragon around the neck like this and held on to him until he passed out and floated down and landed in a field and went to sleep. He didn't hurt the dragon. He just get him, you know, squeezing his neck until he could get him to pass out. And that's how he solved the problem. And what's funny about the story is I can't figure it out because I mean, the Buddha didn't care. He was in his meditation. <laughs> I mean, we have stories about the thunder and lightning storms and everything else. And the Buddha doesn't matter. He's still going to sit in meditation quietly. And some people will say he was in absorption. But we know that you can sit through a lightning storm very easily with an aware jhana because you've ex your mind has accepted completely. Sound is just a sound. And it sounds way far off, but you're not so tight in the absorption it's not that he was there but the story is nice for whoever wants to tell it the stories are nice you know so um yeah so anyway i'm glad sariputta was doing that and my, my favorite picture of all the pictures of the monks in those days was sri lanka used to have a really difficult time they said up around Anuradhapura, you know, because there are 5,000 monks were living up there in, at the time, in the, way back. And uh, they say that they were so advanced in their um, practice, they could fly. And these are not like transcendental meditation where they jump up in the ground and say, I flew. No, 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 no. They're so light. They're folded in, in a, a position for sitting and their bodies are so completely light. They just rose up it's more like back to the future with a hoverboard, you know, it's more like um, they're just floating across the fields. And they said that the farmers had difficulty because they wouldn't stop flying across the fields back and forth. And they were trying to do the harvest. There was a story, I don't know if it was a Jataka tale or what it was, but it was funny, you know, because all the monks were flying, they were floating across the field. So there are these things can be developed, but the question is, um, how much time do you want to put into doing that? And what are you trying to do with your life as a monk or a nun? And how far do you want to go with this? And some of it is useful, but it's not to be done in front of people. That's the big one, because the reason the person's coming to you um, isn't supposed to be for that reason. I actually had a guy call me once from Russia and say the reason he was calling was because he wanted to know if we could teach him to fly. I said, just a minute. <laughs> I went to Bonte and asked him, I have this guy in Russia, he's on the phone, he's in Vladivostok, I wanted to know, do you, can you tell me um, how long do you teach people to fly? And he said, yes. And I said, yes. How long does it take for you to teach me to go and fly? And I, I said, just a minute, <laughs> he, to, he said he has to come here and be around the teacher for a minimum of 10 years. And so he, the guy, he, the, I won't tell you the whole story, but he was upset and we got him to do something instead. And he was very happy with that. He developed and he had a whole story behind him. But the point is, um, people will ask you for the darndest things. <laughs> Recollection so, of past uh, lives. So this uh, Sutta, you will be doing a uh, second part also. Uh, the uh, next well, week will I'm be sorry, the part. I'm, you know, I'm sort of thinking I still want to do it. I'll go through it next time, and you can bring some questions with you about this one. But let's close this now, and let's ask you if you have any questions on what we went over. But these 37 requisites, they come in, they're hooked together, and when you see them written out in their little groups. If you write them all down from the paper I gave you, uh, you will see that the, some things are repeated, 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 you see? But take a look a little closer and you'll see that 
mindfulness is repeated a lot and energy is repeated a lot. Concentration is repeated a lot. And do, does it mean in the same sense each time? Ask yourself the question and scrutinize this and reflect on one of the groups and start practicing them if you haven't refined them. You ask yourself these questions. And the teacher would just ask you to go over it and review the pieces and tell, talk about the, each one, uh, how do you develop it? And you develop it by practicing your practice. Most all of these are affected by the practice of right effort um, as you're applying it using the six R's. And um, someday we can look if you want to do it. Sometime we'll put the, the six R's what do we complete in the six R's? And how do we complete every single part of the Eightfold Path every time that you do the six R's? And uh, you complete the Four Noble Truths every time, you see? So questions, anybody? Hmm? You must have done a good job. Does anybody have a question? Ulysses, what you got? No, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment about the, uh, you know, this, the, the difference between the first part of the sutta, which is really more about what we can do for the cessation of, of suffering, you know, the cessation of all this, because that's, 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 that's really what, if you, if you put it all together, that first section was all about how we obtain, you know, liberation and cessation. And then the second part that had to do with more with superpowers and all that, I feel like the first part is the most important because that's the here and now. This is what's important. I think dealing with the other stuff, I mean, it's very romantic, very fantastic, very all that, but it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't really address the issues of like the, the important issues, which is the suffering of every day. You know, yeah. it just adds more to more to our list of to do. <laughs> yeah, so. well, actually, you are doing all of them. One of the points of looking at the at the the 37 is to reflect when you read each one and say, how does the six R's complete what I need to know about this and that and the other as you're going through all this, you see? Now, you're right about that. You're absolutely right. The front part of the sutta was actually dedicated to explaining to Udayan why the followers were respecting the Buddha in the Buddha's mind, why they should reflect him. And um, uh, I'm sorry why they should respect him and that's what it's all about so from page 635 where you start to go through the five qualities and then you flow into the 37 requisites of enlightenment from page, section 10 his answer to Udayan uh, is to tell why they respect him and honor him and support him and depend on him that's why are the 37 pieces, okay? Five faculties, seven enlightenment, nor, nor, eight full path. Now the eight liberations, I'm a little bit, you should look, you should ask for me this week. If you go up there, ask him. The eight liberations, did it come from, uh, there is a note, 764, but um, okay, it's MA. And so, okay, so it's the Ati Atika, right? Um, I hate that I never can remember. The MA is the um, Majima Nikaya Atakata. That means there was a commentary ad added to explaining the Majima Nikaya, the Atakata. And the eight, um, the eight liberations, that's where that comes from. And we'll talk about that next week. The eight bases of transcendence. I have to go through and figure that stuff out for you because some of this stuff is coming out of the, the Sudimaga and some of it's just um, just there, but I have to look up the um, background parts for you. Um, but all of it, basically, I understand what all of it is. I mean, I understand. I, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that the, you know, I'm not saying that these other, you know, this second section is not important because there are definitely a lot of people who are sensitive, you know, like natural, whether they- No, but it isn't to, important. And the thing is, I want know. them to know it's not important to yeah. develop those and show anybody. That's what I'm talking about. Right. 
Right. We have enough damage in the in the dilution of the Dhamma right now today that we don't need people dancing around saying, I can fly, I can fly. You know, come and support me, feed me, build a temple so I can fly. We don't need that. That's not going to help the world. Now, this is me speaking because I'm very much a person that wants to give this to people to find peace, contentment, and even out things in the world. That's not going to even out things in the world. It's going to show you somebody can fly. And these things are not technically that useful to show the public. That doesn't mean if there was an Arahat and he had all of these developed, he couldn't sit in a temple someplace and help people by doing it for them privately, but they go visit him. But just think about how people are today in this society. My gosh, it would be on Facebook in a minute. <laughs> no, I think both of them, uh, you are telling the same thing. And, uh, so I think uh, Ulysses is also uh, saying your yeah. point. Essentially. Same thing, same thing. I have to go, at, the water's coming. It happens every time. Okay. Just <laughs> it's fun. And the water's here, that's remarkable. <laughs> because when I look back in 2000 and um, let's see, in 2003, when we went into this location, there was no water. <laughs> and um, for cleaning and scrubbing and washing, we had to go to the stream and carry buckets of water back to the house, to this old house that was there. And if you wanted the stuff, any water in your trailer, you had to have buckets to flush the toilets that were there. And you had to do everything by hand. So it was real interesting. You just say, okay, fine, <laughs> this is real. And you go for it, that's the way it was. Okay, so is there anything else about this that you see, Ulysses, about it? No, no, I was just trying to, um, you know, go back to the issue that there, some people, you know, are like are naturally born sensitive, like people who have psychic powers already naturally sensitive. Yeah. And, and so this information is important, you know, for people who already have that, you know, that sensitivity, and they don't know what to do with it, you know, but I think for most people is the here and now the tactile, you know, the what comes through the five, you know, uh, exterior doors, you know, yeah. and, and, and what you know, in the, in the amounts of suffering, I think there is also an incredible amount of suffering that happens to people who happen to be very sensitive on the other, on the other, in the other sense, you know, when they, when they and receive suffering, it. The suffering for them is mental, Correct. predominantly mental. Yeah. If, if that would be, that would be from the mind, from the mind door. Yeah. Yeah. I had a friend once who was uh, very sensitive to channeling and started channeling. Something happened and and the person started channeling and the torturous thing for this person was about a month long it thought she she was just going to go insane because this was happening and um i learned a lot about that at that time because um she had to find somebody who was a coach and there was a woman connected with the monroe institute in uh, virginia and she lived near where this person lived and they went and visited. And that person explained things about channeling that none of us would even think about. So if you're ever channeling with something that's coming through to you, you might not be going insane. You might actually be hooked into someone and there's a few things you need to do and it's to relax into it and actually just have a talk with, don't be afraid of having a talk with this person some night and letting them know, you know, I live on a planet where there's 24 hours in a day <laughs> and I get up at a certain time and I work for eight hours and this sort of thing. And, and what happened was uh, Rosie had to teach her to understand that the place that person was and she was, was like two different dimensions with different time frames and different laws about space and time. So there wasn't anything wrong with her being able to work with this person and find out some wonderful information. But in the beginning, it was like being in hell because she didn't have anybody to guide and explain uh, what was really happening, you see? And once the, what you say entity or per channeling the person at the other end, once you have them understanding they can be very compassionate. If they're not compassionate, 
then it's time to shut the relationship off. But if they are compassionate, there's no reason why you can't continue to get information, share information, that sort of thing can happen okay. So these things are not impossible. I know this from my, my friend very, very much so. And, uh, but they are, they've got different, different framework of um, universal laws is what it's about, a different framework. And um, when people are able to open this up, it's wonderful, that's great. But you have to be careful with what you do with it in our society, because it just a lot of opens, opens a lot of doors that can be dangerous if you're not careful, that's all. So I think we had a pretty good lesson on the 37 and they, they help us. Uh, the more we, we take a look at the chart, I used to keep a chart similar to the one I gave you. I can't find it. It's a beautiful chart that a, an IT person did for me and I'm still trying to find it. Um, but if I find it, I'll send it to you. It's a beautiful chart laid out to just stick it in a frame on the wall and kind of see the relationship. And another thing, on the chart, it goes four, 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 five, five, seven, eight, and that's 37. But the way that you naturally discover these and develop them is four, four, five, four, five, seven, eight. So you can write that down and you can look at it and check it. What I'm shifting around is the five faculties and the five powers and something happens between the five faculties and five powers as they're a, you're first meeting them and learning about them. And these things evolve in the development of the twin practice very well, okay? So are we, are we done? Yeah, you think? Any other questions? Yes, I think we have. Okay, and we will cut off now because any second the water's gonna come in the other bucket. <laughs> <laughs> I love this place. Okay, here we go. Suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share the spirit of our may they long protect the buddha's dispensation sadhu 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 thank you sister thank you bante thank you for coming okay thank then i'll you. end it for everything Okay, thanks. <laughs>